afortunadamente en la vida de Aristóteles pues, no lo tenía bastante fácil porque su vida se divide muy claramente en tres periodos. Starting when he was 17, he studied at the academy in Athens under Plato and spent 20 years there. The middle period of his life, he traveled very much um, along the coast of what is today Turkey. He went up to Macedon and tutored the young Alexander there. Um, there was great political turmoil at that time. And then the last 10 years of his life, he was back in Athens teaching again. So we had two quiet periods and then a very busy middle period. El eh, primero de los periodos comienza más o menos cuando tiene 17 años y vuelve a la academia eh, con Platón, eh, pasa allí 20 años. El periodo intermedio es un periodo en el que viaja mucho y llega bueno, a, a, lo, a lo largo de la costa a lo que sería la actual Turquía, llega hasta Macedonia y trabaja con un tutor de Alejandro. Es una época de mucha convulsión política. Y la última parte, el último periodo, serían los últimos 10 años en que regresa a Atenas. Ahí vive una época muy, muy agitada en, en ese periodo intermedio de su vida. Um, so for a novelist, it was, um, in English we say no brainer, um, it, it was an easy choice to, to pick that middle period to, to dramatize because externally in Greece um, there were great changes happening. Uh, Macedonia defeated Athens during that time and effectively ended Athenian democracy set the stage for the big eastward campaigns of, of Alexander. Also, also um, Aristotle, his own future was uncertain. He had wanted to uh, follow Plato as head of the academy and they wouldn't have him, partly I think because he was Macedonian and not Athenian, partly because he disagreed with, with Plato's teachings or developed them into something very different. So he didn't know what his future would hold. So external turmoil, internal turmoil. Mm -hmm. That was the period of things. Bueno, como novelista era lo que se dice vulgarmente de cajón elegir el periodo intermedio, porque por un lado había una serie de convulsiones políticas en Grecia, es decir, una convulsión externa. Eh, había eh, estaba produciendo grandes cambios en la vida en Grecia. Eh, Macedonia derrota en aquella época a Atenas. Es, supone realmente el fin de la democracia. De hecho, Aristóteles, el futuro de Aristóteles personal también eh, está bastante en el aire. Él quería verse como sucesor de Platón, pero no estaba tan claro que fuese a ser elegido como su sucesor en la academia. Por un lado, porque precisamente él era macedonio, venía de aquella zona, y por otro lado, quizá también por sus ideas. Es decir, se estaba produciendo una convulsión en el exterior y también una convulsión personal en Aristóteles. Now, of course, um... I've described that the book began with Aristotle for me, and it ended up being called El Maestro de Alejandro, and I realized sort of late in the game that once I picked that period of his life, suddenly I had this other character I was going to have to deal with, who was the very young 13-year-old um, Alexander, and I had to figure out how to make him a character. So initially, he was, in my mind, he was a much lesser character, but he very quickly took over the novel and became very equal in scope to Aristotle, and their relationship became the central um, spine in the novel. Bueno, realmente el libro, como os cuento, comienza con eh, la personalidad del personaje de Aristóteles, pero como veis el título es el maestro de Alejandro, entonces realmente lo que ocurrió fue que eh, esta figura de este niño, de este chaval de 13 años, va apareciendo poco a poco a lo largo de la escritura del libro, eh, y pasa de ser un personaje menor, a ir ganando terreno hasta llegar a convertirse en un personaje con la misma importancia que podía estar teniendo ya Aristóteles en mi mente, e incluso llegar a ocupar un lugar central ¿no? en la novela. Si queréis, eh, ya plantear algunas preguntas, o yo encantada de seguir hablando. Yo creo que es que cuando tenemos una pregunta, ya no hablamos. Sabía que ya. The two things I, I guess I would like to talk about next, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about the language, the use of language in the book, because I think that's something that has, mm -hmm. um, that has surprised people and has made this an, a slightly unusual work of historical fiction, and then I guess I'll talk a little bit about um, how I, the, the creation of the two main characters. 
Pues hay dos cosas de las que me gustaría hablaros ahora. En primer lugar, del, del estilo, de las palabras, de, de, del lenguaje que utilizo, porque creo que ha sido bastante sorprendente en general. Me gustaría explicaros por qué he elegido este estilo. Y en segundo lugar, me gustaría hablaros pues, de la creación de los personajes. Um, one of the very first problems that I faced when I was writing the book, I found that I kept uh, slipping into a very a, a British sort of diction as opposed to a North American diction. One of the first problems that I encountered when I was writing the book was that I started to realize that I was falling into a very British diction, a diction very British, compared to what would be a French diction, a more North American And I think the reason for that is that I fear most of the translations into English of the ancient texts were done you know, in the 19th and early 20th century by people in Oxford and Cambridge. And so in, in English, we, we tend to hear the language of the writings of the ancient world with a bit of a British accent. La razón es bastante clara. La mayor parte de las traducciones de las obras antiguas, de los clásicos, en el mundo anglosajón se produjeron, se, se llevaron a cabo en el siglo XIX, principios del siglo XX y eh, fueron hechas por intelectuales de Cambridge, de Oxford. Entonces estamos acostumbrados a ver esas obras con un estilo muy británico. But I found that frustrating because that's not, it's not my voice when I speak. And I thought as soon as you write in English about ancient Greece, it is an anachronism. And so why is it more of an anachronism to use a North American dialect as opposed to a British dialect. It isn't. It's simply a, a choice for the author to make. Esto me resultaba muy frustrante porque eh, me daba cuenta de que no era mi propia voz de norteamericana. Eh, ya el mero hecho de escribir un texto antiguo, un clásico en inglés, ya es un anacronismo. ¿Por qué va a ser un anacronismo escribirlo en norteamericano, en, una, en un dialecto inglés más norteamericano? Porque tenemos que quedarnos con la versión británica. And I felt so strongly, I, I admired Aristotle so much and felt so strongly that he was my, part of my intellectual inheritance as a Canadian. I thought that I should be able to write about him and speak about him with a Canadian accent. Uh, admiro tanto a Aristóteles, le tengo como un, una parte tan central de mi legado cultural que notaba la necesidad de, 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 de expresarme eh, sobre él con mi propia voz de canadiense. And then the other factor, which I um, had to take into account as I was writing this, was that I was writing about a warrior culture, a soldier's culture. And it felt very, very wrong for me to imagine, you know, someone getting a spear in the arm and saying, oh, good Lord, bloody hell, that hurt, you know, in, 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 for people who speak English, you know. It's just, it's false. I, I don't believe that's, that's the way that people would have spoken. So the language in the book is, is actually quite crude. Mm. Otro de los factores que me planteé es que eh, realmente el libro está ambientado en una cultura muy belicosa de soldados, de guerreros, y de alguna manera me, me resultaba muy chocante que a un soldado le, le hirieran con una espada o con una lanza y exclamara, oh cielo santo, Juan, de, 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 un estilo muy barroco y británico, vaya, me sonaba muy falso. Eh, de hecho, por eso elegí esta clase de lenguaje que es bastante más rudo, más crudo, me parecía mucho más apropiado. Um, so I think that's the first sort of shock of the book, is, is, and I know people have told me this, that just even in the first few pages, they hit a, a kind of a language and they hit a use of words which is very, uh, well, North American, it can be quite coarse, it can be, it's very uh, sexual in some parts, it's very um, street in a way, I, I don't know if you have any word that word in Spanish. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Pues eh, realmente esto es, eh, constituye uno de los primeros impactos del libro. Ya desde las primeras páginas hay lectores que me han comentado pues, este, este choque que les produce encontrarse con esta clase de idioma tan norteamericano. Sí, son palabras bastante más vulgares, hay lenguaje con referencias sexuales, digamos callejero casi. And I do think that was true to the language of the time. Um, if you want to look for okay, no overt sexuality in ancient Greece, you look at Aristophanes plays if you want to you know, look at the, the language. I, I spoke to a, an ancient Greek linguist who told me that there is, for instance, a, there was an ancient Greek equivalent for the word fuck in English. 
which I think, again, I don't know how that translates into Spanish. It's very crude in English. Mm -hmm. And they had a word that was equivalent with the equivalent uh, shock value, and that was used at that 